Well, good morning. First day of the conference, so you know, no hangover, so at least your minds are here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, as uh, Scott said, my name is Todd Weidemann. I'm an independent consultant for online game mechanics and free-to-play monetization. Uh, my largest client is uh, Ubisoft Blue White. That's the reason why the logos are here. Um, my career went through all ups and downs you can imagine. I'm working into games since nearly 30 years. Um, every single job you can name, I have done. Um, I was artist, programmer, etc. everything. I was uh, CTO of a public listed company, meaning that my career is at its end. You, you can't move any higher, so now it's all about the money. Um, I, have, I have done uh, a lot of games on Amiga and uh, computers where some of you weren't even born. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty proud of that. I wasted the youth of a lot of people who I now know, so I'm happy about that. Um, a couple of companies I worked for, some of, you know, most of them are just, they no longer exist, but that's normal in our game industry. That's why I love the game industry, because it's changing all the time. Some involvement I did um, is uh, the titles from uh, Ubisoft Blue Byte. Uh, they are major free-to-play titles, which starts with the Settlers Online, uh, the most uh, successful free-to-play title they have. It's nearly five years old now and still online and still going well. Um, I worked on Silent Hunter Online, on Anno Online, and My Magic Heroes Online. They're all Flash-based browser games, you know, browser games were the cool thing before the iPhone hit the market. Um, they're still going strong, but, you know, the new sexy thing, of course, is mobile. My further involvement at Ubisoft, which again is my largest client, is uh, that I did the post-launch monetization and pricing of PvP for Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. Um, I worked on the post-launch monetization strategy of Ani 2070. You know, even retail games go to sort of free-to-play stuff. Turn off your phones, thank you very much. Someone set this alarm to now, you know, that's really late. Okay. Um, and uh, I, always, uh, I uh, also was online mechanics and monetization supervisor for Panzer General Online, which is one of our latest titles, uh, which you can play in uh, all sorts of languages. Um, I did some monetization optimization for MQEL, which is the, the shortcut for Mighty Quest for Epic Loot. Um, and I actually train a lot of teams at Ubisoft um, and educate them what free-to-play is all about. So enough from, uh, from me. Um, I want to tell you a little bit how I actually dissect titles. Um, Scott hasn't mentioned that, but this is actually the third talk I do about uh, pretty successful free-to-play games. The first one was about World of Tanks, uh, which is uh, my most famous talk. The second one about Puzzle and Dragons, and now the third, and this is world premiere, actually. You forgot to mention that. It's a world premiere. About it's the world premiere. <laughs> the world premiere, you know, dissecting League of Legends. Um, I think most people know League of Legends. Um, actually, I think most, most of the world knows what League of Legends is about. So this is a three-step process. I'm going through every, any title, so I'll walk you through that uh, for a little bit. Um, the, the first topic I always touch is metrics, but because we don't have the metrics of League of Legends, I use all public sources I can get my hands upon. So I use Comscore, Alexa, TrafficEstimate.com, which is basically traffic measuring tools. You have to use these tools with a grain of salt, you know, be careful because they're using trackers, cookies, and, you know, so, sort of evil programs they insert into clients' machines to actually measure the user behavior, and then they extrapolate that and think this is worldwide traffic. This is, of course, not true, so you have to be careful, you have to know how their tools work. Um, I also research uh, Riot's or the owner of Riot's PR. So what numbers do they release? And even these numbers, you have to be careful because PR numbers usually are not the true numbers. So in uh, World of Tanks, they said they have 70 million users, which is of course wrong. What they really are saying is they have 70 million registrations, which is of course not the active users. Now we are really lucky with Riot because they are really honest and open company, so they basically give you any metric you need, but the financial ones, but the financial ones I'm actually going to reveal to you um, in a couple of minutes. And of course, you know, if they do conference talks, you can get a lot of numbers out there, you know, GTC Vault Access, Schedule Connect, wherever Riot talks about their numbers, you can get a lot of information from them. Then of course I play the title. Um, League of Legends is a must-to-play title. Everybody should play that because it's one of the most successful free-to-play titles out there. Um, the problem here is that if you have played League of Legends before, basically your mind is no longer in an objective mode. So what you have to train yourself is that you forget everything you know about the title, make a new account, and start from scratch. So I did that. I played without paying for, for a while. I just measure the friction. I measure what the game does to me. I measure how much I earn, what I gain, how the pl game plays, how newbie-friendly it is. Um, and you know, when you're like in the mid-game, I actually stop. So when I went through all these points, 
I actually start paying. So I go back to, let's say, end of early game, and I start paying with $10. The reason why I start with $10, because this is the most popular entry point for payers. Most games, minus mobile, most players actually pay $10 at the start because they want to see how does the game feel being a payer. Most people who are used to pay actually do that from the beginning. They register, they pay, and then they play. About 40% of paying users are actually doing this. I maximize my spending rewards, meaning that I only buy the really coolest stuff which helps me in my game. I don't buy rubbish or vanity stuff or whatever, you know, just the stuff that really helps my game, which are usually the most popular items because most people think, you know, oh, this is like the coolest stuff. This is like the first thing you should delete out of your mind. Payers are not stupid people. They are highly intelligent, they know what they buy, and if they buy repeatedly, you know, basically they know if they get back worth of their spending. So now I research the changes. Basically, what does the game to me when I play it as a payer? Usually it should feel different. If your game doesn't feel different when you pay or when you don't pay, you do something wrong because most people won't pay at all. So the game should be more rewarding to you when you pay. And this is a very difficult thing to measure because again, you have to set back a little bit, forget a little bit what you know about the game and then see what the game does to you depending on your first session or sessions where you didn't pay. And of course, you know, how does the friction change, the progress, you know, how does the game change? Is it more rewarding? Do I win more? You know, critical question, especially here in this game. Um, and sometimes I always uh, uh, make a second payment, which is usually higher, about $50, and see if that changes every, anything. So that usually you can measure the RPPU, which is the monthly spending per month, because you can see, is $10 a month enough to give me satisfaction? Or if I spend $50, it's, a mu it's even a better game. This is an important psychological thing the game has to do to you. So let's see if we can find any metrics. <coughs> um, some of these metrics are a year old, and the reason for that I will ex explain in a second, uh, but I, I also show you the, the latest uh, metrics I found. Um, this is Alexa and Comscore stuff. It looks all sorts of complicated, but uh, the, the fascinating thing here is that you actually see the ranking of the page in this country, um, meaning that how important is the League of Legends website in this country. So in, in the US, it's in the top 800 most important websites, and that's pretty awesome for a game to be up there. It's not Google, which is number one, but you know, at least it's uh, high there. Depending on the page rank in the country, you can also measure how popular it is in this country. And uh, the next slide will actually um, show you a little bit about that. Very interesting, the gender. Um, it's a huge male audience. Uh, there are not a lot of females, less than 8% playing League of Legends. Uh, that has to do with how the game works. It's a pure PvP game, very hardcore. So it's actually not designed for women. Um, and the most surprising thing is education. Ch check out that slide. Most people have no college. So people who don't know how to read these charts say, oh, okay, only stupid people play League of Legends. That's, that's of course not true. Um, the truth is that most people playing League of Legends are so young that they don't even have an education finished yet. This is basically what this chart means. And we go back to that in a second. And of course, browsing locations where they actually play, you know, most of them at home. So here you see the visitors by country, where is League of Legends very popular. Um, you will be surprised that China is actually not here. And the reason, this is another thing you have to remember when you read these charts, is that the internet of China is pretty much isolated. It cannot be measured properly by Comscore and Alexa, meaning that Asia you always have to kind of measure on the side. So outside Asia, you see here the most popular countries, and you see you know, United States, France, Canada, Germany, and Turkey are the top five. Um, Search engine stuff is just for researchers who want to see you know, how the advertising works. And of course, they also show you the keywords people use in Google to actually search for this game. This is kind of important information for marketing people. Uh, but you can look that up. You know, Alexa and Comscore is free. You just enter the URL and you get all this information. So this is very small. You can look it up in the slides later on. But basically, <coughs> what one of these tools is uh, uh, giving you is that at what subdomain does the visitor go to depending on its location. Um, League of Legends is so nice that they have a subdomain for every single country and server, so you can exactly see the percentage distribution of the people visiting their servers depending on location. 
So in here, NA is North America, EUW uh, is European Union West, so the, the European server. The sign up is, of course, the registration page, and so on. Um, and you see that it's a very North American dominated game for them, minus Asia, remember that. So this is a screenshot directly from their, uh, from their website, another information you can get, what language do they support. So if League of Legends says, okay, we are supporting Turkish, it means, of course, that this support is worthwhile or they're actually expanding to this market. Um, so you can see what kind of languages they cover and uh, what territories is uh, interesting for them. And here you actually see Oceania and the, the uh, Republic of Korea servers. So this is official Riot PR from end of 2013. <coughs> Most of the numbers I'm going to show you here is end of 2013 because the nice thing here is that I can make a cut and synchronize that with their financial reports because it's a public listed company, their owner. So I can sync the financial statements they have together with the numbers and do some calculation. And we will do that calculation after I show you the numbers. So end of 2013, they claim they have 32 million monthly active players. Whatever they mean with monthly active players is another story, but usually, you know, when you play the game at least once a month, you're flagged as a monthly active user. At least we, we, we just pretend it is like that. Um, meanwhile, of course, they have more than 67 million. So you see how crazy they go. Um, and you see you know, World of Warcraft and some other games in, in comparison, uh, but this is a really astonishing number. It's one of the largest online games we have. The daily active players, something you rarely get, and they, you know, they just give you the numbers officially. Um, if it's true or not, we don't know, but from the calculations, it's pretty precise. Uh, from, you know, I verified the numbers for various sources, and you know, uh, Riot doesn't lie about these numbers, at least you know, from my information I have. So end of 2013, they had 12 million active, uh, daily active users, and now it's up to 27 million. Can you imagine the servers you need to actually support 27 million users a day? You know, it's a pretty active game. The average daily visitors for Instagram, whatever that means, uh, not important for us. And of course, as a comparison, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. So here they say the peak concurrent users, another thing which you rarely get, um, specifically because you don't know what servers they're talking about, but as, as far as I know, they basically take all servers together and they say, you know, this is the highest number of people online ever they had, 7.5 7 million. End of 2013 is worth 3 million. Um, this number is really nice because you can actually extrapolate from peak concurrent to daily active to monthly active and see, you know, how the curve goes and verify the numbers because there's a sort of um, stable mathematics between these three numbers. And if you know them, you know, you can verify if these numbers are true. Um, so this is like the first game where I get nearly all the numbers from the PR and I actually believe the numbers. M most of the other ones I had to really dig deeper in order to do that. Um, and you know, thank you, Wright, for actually doing that. You know, it's, uh, it's very good for education. Now this, this is the first hint why most people don't have college. Um, 90 percent, over 90 percent, are male. 85 percent are between 16 and 30. I actually, you know, you can actually claim that over 70 percent of their players are far younger than 25. So it's a very male-dominated young audience. And that's very common for most action-based PvP games. Most action-based PvP games have a young player base. That's the reason why, for example, Turkey is so important for PvP games, because half of their population is male and younger than 25. It's a perfect match for a PvP action game in here. And 60% are enrolled in or have completed some college. Um, but, you know, that means that 40% don't. So they're actually, you know, too young to actually have finished that. This is pretty important in terms of PvP. So whenever you do a PvP game, which is action-based, and you think you can target a 35-year-old guy because, you know, that's where, like, the peak money is, um, you might be wrong. So they claim it's the most played video game in the world. Um, I think the Asians will say uh, uh, no. Um, but, you know, let's say outside Asia is the most played video game in the world. Um, and that's, that's why it's so interesting to actually go deeper in the numbers and see uh, what it's all about. <coughs> They are also very esports driven, and there's a reason for that. It's not only because esports is cool and it's community service, but because also Riot has a problem. And this problem you we will go into, you know, in a couple of minutes, why this esports is actually replacing another thing what you guys are doing for your games. And uh, if you watch the price money, you know, it's crazy numbers. 
Um, the, the only game which beats them now is actually Dota 2. I think they have a 5 million prize money for the first places, which is actually bigger here, because this is the complete prize pool divided into two sections, like qualification and the end game. But nevertheless, um, if, you, if you have the finals, and there are over 30 million people looking at the finals, they're actually competing you know, with the major sports events in the world. So this is huge. As you might know, uh, Tencent is an investor in Riot Games and actually bought them a couple of years ago. Um, and Tencent, if you add everything up, um, is the largest gaming company in the world. At least that's what they claim. Tencent is a very odd setup. If you ever read the Wikipedia of Tencent, you see that they're actually not a true gaming company. There's all sorts of inv investments here. Um, and most people think Tencent actually is an Asian company. And if you, if you go deeper, they actually are not. It's a South African company. Which, you know, most people are surprised. But if you look at the history, you will see that. <coughs> but uh, I found it interesting because their company, they, when they um, uh, publish their shareholder reports, it's a very interesting thing because all the numbers you can see here, you can attach to all the games. And from there, you can see how much revenue does League of Legends do a year. <coughs> uh, Superdata uh, is always an interesting company and in their numbers, uh, which I, you know, I'm always happy to use. So uh, they have a very nice uh, chart published, I think it was last year, um, the ARPU, average revenue per user um, per month, that includes non-payers. Um, and you know, World of Tanks number one with $4.51, and League of Legends are number 10 with $1.32. So if you, you know ARPU is usually used for marketing. How much can marketing spend to actually acquire a user? So if I spend $2 to acquire a user, but I only earn a dollar thirty per user, that's not going to work. So how does Riot actually do marketing? Because you know, you know, uh, how much does a user today cost? Like during peak times, even five dollars or more. Um, so one thirty-two is actually very bad. So there might be a problem here. We have to identify. And here they added up the yearly revenue of all the games. So Crossfire is one of the really big game, uh, games from, uh, from Asia. And League of Legends with 624 million a year. And that was the 2013 number. And we can sync that with other numbers I told you before. So if their ARPU is 132, it means that either they have an PPU problem, which is you know, how much does a payer spend a month on average, or they have a conversion problem. Because otherwise, this ARPU would be better. And now we have to actually dig deep to find out which one of it is. And as I said, you know, the user acquisition with that low ARPU is very, very difficult. And now we know why League of Legends is so heavily into esports, because this is their number one acquisition tool for users. This is why they do all this you know, big hype, big viewer base, big price money. Because have you ever seen a League of Legends advertising in the web or anywhere else? You won't find any. They don't do advert. Well, they might do advertising or you know um, cooperation deals, but it's very rare. You see many other games there, but League of Legends is the exception. So just a short view of what League of Legends is. I won't go deep into League of Legends what it is because I assume that you know about that game. Um, basically, it's a MOBA. It's a word which is called you know multi online battle arena game. Uh, it has been invented by the first Dota, which is a Warcraft 3 mod. Um, and from this Warcraft 3 mod, which was very popular, called Dota, you know, two companies split. One, wa one was Riot, they did League of Legends, they made this mobile very, very popular due to their success. And the other one is the Dota 2 team, which is now working on Valve and which is their biggest competitor. It's basically a team versus team arena PvP game. So, you know, there's one team, very small, and fighting against another team, and you have certain victory conditions. It was published end of 2009, um, and developed and published, of course, by Riot. Now, they are owned by Tencent, um, and they bought the company for $230 million, which, considering the revenue they do and how large League of Legends is, is actually a steal. This is very cheap for that company, so it was a very wise investment. Um, the interesting thing, which I didn't know, is that Tencent actually already owned 22% of that company originally. So, you know, down there in 2008, they owned 22%, and they bought the rest for $230 million. Um, I guess anyone with that spare cash would have bought Riot if they have you know, the knowledge from today. So they're into eSports since 2010. Uh, two million prize money in season two, which was, you know, uh, which is now put to shame because they now have like up to five million. Um, it went quickly to be the most popular online game and they have an exponential growth. So you know, whatever numbers you know from 2011 and 12, it's like all the base and suddenly in 2013 it, it, it explodes. 
you have seen they have 32 million active users in 2013 and more than twice in, in this year. And we will see where their numbers take them uh, uh, end of this year. But, and this is a, a problem of League of Legends, anyone who's now like keen, oh, I want to play this game, uh, it's a very, very hard game to learn, and it's very hard to master, and everyone here in this room who's over 30, it's impossible to master for you. <laughs> <laughs> You, you love to play it, but you're successful? <laughs> it is possible to play it, but it depends what success means. Yeah, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that you're a bad player, but you know, I, for me it's a really frustrating game, because you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just getting killed all the time. You know? and, and then I get shouted at, you know, you're a newbie, you know, and you're whatever. You know, it's like, I have to beep the words they actually call me, uh, because you know, I'm actually playing stupid, I don't know. And we go into detail a little bit why that is in a second, and why also this is actually a problem for the monetization, which is an interesting thing. The hard to learn and hard to master is very, very attractive for 16 to 25 year old male players. This is the game system they love to play. This is you know, basically where their heart is. That's the reason why this game attracts so many players of this age. So some League of Legends competitors, uh, Dota 2, the biggest one, it's very, very successful. They have a completely different monetization than League of Legends, so you know, I might actually dissect this at some point. Uh, here's of Neverworth, Solaces Arena, which is on mobile, um, Defense of the Ancients. Um, there are even some mobile games on iPad. There are like three or four really good League of Legends competitors, but I don't think the iPad is the right platform for this game, but you know, no one asks me, oh well. I think the average age of the iPad gamer is much older than a mobile player. So let's check, let's check a little bit what do they sell? How do they make money? So they have a dual currency system, which most free-to-play game has, and I recommend that heavily. If you go single currency, you might actually fail. Um, there are soft currency, which I call you know, the in-game currency you can actually earn for free. It's called IP, or influence points. And the hard currency, which you buy, is called right points, or RP. And the R IP, RP, you can actually win through matches, while the RP actually is no longer true. I will explain that in a second. Most items they have are sold with both IP and RP prices on it. So whatever item you want, they have both prices. So there's a hard price for dollars, the right points, and there's a soft price which for the IP. So you don't need to spend money for anything you want to buy. You just have to play a lot, grind that IP, and when you have enough, you can buy any item you want without spending money. That's actually bad for monetization. But you know, they, they seem to be successful with that. We'll see in a second. Um, they sell champions, runes, room rune pages, skins, boosts, name or server changes. We go into detail a little bit in the following slides. I had to cross out this one. Some RP are given free by progress. That was like in the beginning. Uh, Riot was very uh, you know, generous, giving you RP for all sorts of stuff. And over the years, they actually cut that down. Now you don't get any free RP at all. Um, this is a sign that their monetization system is not optimal because otherwise I would actually give out free RP because it's a really nice preview for people. They say, hey, look, I just earned 100 RP, you know, because I'm level 10 and I can buy some stuff. This is cool, I might actually spend money. It's the usual stuff you do in free-to-play games. They don't. And that's a sign that giving away free RP actually hurts their monetization. <coughs> so since launch, they reduced that to zero. The interesting thing here is that uh, they have a whole roster of champions, over 100. Champions is the, the hero you play, and every champion plays different, and there are like five, six, seven different roles you can play, from supporter to jungler to whatever. Um, and these, these champions are specialized in certain roles, which they, of course, don't tell you. So in order to play this game perfectly, you have to learn over 100 champions. So every couple of months, they release a new champion. You can buy that. Um, for RP, and after a while you can buy it actually for both IP and RP. Um, every week they rotate the champions. So from these 100 whatever, there are uh, uh, 10 champions you can play for free. You have the basic set, plus 10 every week with change, you don't need to pay for. And these change, you know, through all these uh, champions they have. So if you play for 10 weeks, you have seen, and you could play over 100 champions. Which is a nice way to preview, right? If you want to test a certain champion, if it's worth buying, you just wait till it's available for free, you play it for a week, and then you can decide if you want to buy it or not. Um, the problem here is that in order to succeed in this game, you have to know what the opponent champion can do. So 
So there's an opponent coming to you, and in order to counter his attacks and actually beat him, you have to know how it works. So in order to be successful in this game, you have to play and learn all 100 champions. So in the beginning they had far less champions, now they have more and more, and if they release more and more champions, the game actually gets more and more complicated over time. So it's for beginners, you know, you're like, you pick one champion, and usually what you do is, so, oh, this champion looks nice, so you just pick it. You don't know if it's strong or not. You have no idea what role he does. So you jump into a game and just play and see, oh, look how cool I am, and you go in there and then you die a lot. Because you have no idea what the other champions are doing to you, but the other people who play you usually do, how, you know, do know how to kill you. So this is a very frustrating experience if you're a first-time player. And as I said, the champion rotation has a really bad side effect. So they rotate the champions, free access, which is nice, but whenever a new champion enters the arena, like they release a new one, the old champion which was for sale is lowered in price. What that means is that if you bought the champion the first time it came out because you said, oh, cool, new champion, I just buy that, it's just $10, you just buy it. But a couple of weeks later, it's devalued in price. Now that's not good because the value for money I spent in the game has just been halved. This is like a really frustrating experience for many players who invest in this game. And the other thing they always do is that the new champions are overpowered. They're just too strong. Like, super strong hero and everybody wants to buy it, right? So all the buyers go and buy it because it's so overpowered. But over time, they actually nerf it, which is the cool word to actually do that. So they lower the abilities of the champion until it's balanced and equal with others. So not only you lose the value of the champion when you buy it by half, but all the powers you found cool, you lose as well. Now how bad is that? It is like you, you buy a Ferrari, you know, $250,000. And after three months time, right, they, they like sell the whole car for half of that. And you would see, oh, that's frustrating. You know, I could have had that Ferrari for, you know, less than half the price. And uh, another couple of weeks, you know, they replace your engine with a Fiat engine. That's exactly what they do. And they're brutally honest about it. You know, this is an official statement from Riot. And you know, they said currently Lucian is overpowered, this is the currently overpowered champion, but they didn't have time to balance it. So they just leave it overpowered and you know, everybody is like, oh my god, not again a Lucian, it's imbalancing the whole game. And you know, th this is like, does this sound familiar? They're making even fun out of it. It's like, you know, oh well, another balanced champion. Oh well, yeah, does that sound familiar? Most champions are imbalanced, which are introduced. This is a very frustrating experience for buyers. <coughs> and this leads to a, what I call lifetime problem, unless you're younger than 25 and male. Um, so there are over 119 champions for you to learn. Yeah, good luck with that. If you start League of Legends now, you might be really frustrated with this. It's very hard to pick the first champions. Basically, you have no idea what champion to pick. So whatever you choose is already a wrong choice. And that, you know, you have to read up a lot of guides and stuff, but who does that? You know, download the game League of Legends, register, jump in, start, and see, hey, how cool is that? Well, you get beaten all the time, 90%. I don't know how long you needed to actually have a fight where you really... I've been playing for months, I'm still and I don't have Yeah, okay. It's a very time-intensive game as well, yeah. And again, I repeat myself, you know, new champions are overpowered, get nerfed after a few weeks all the time, and reduced quickly by price. Um, and the mastery of League of Legends is very, very complex. So it's not an easy game to play. Now here's the funny thing. I interviewed a lot of pro, pro gamers who play League of Legends and asked them, you know, how does League of Legends compete against Dota 2 or you know, Heroes of Neverworth, etc., or the other co competitions. And they say League of Legends is the easiest MOBA to play. I kind of, you, wait a second, so the other ones are even more complicated and difficult and they say yes. What the heck is wrong with that? So, you know, it seems that the 16 to 25 year old, you know, wanted harder, harder and harder, you know, just to, to beat that mechanic. And the other beginner problem, these are screenshots from chat. I, I, should I read this? I, I can read this. You know, a player to another one, you know, when you're a newbie and get beaten, basically another player tells you, get cancer and die, you fucking trash truths, I will guess your families. With all sorts of spelling mistakes. This is not an exception. The chat in League of Legends is horror. What you read there, you know, cannot be displayed on public TV. It's a very aggressive chat, and what, when, you know, you, l you learn new swear words. If you want to have a new swear word for whoever, you just log in League of Legends. And 
The interesting thing is just, you know, be a week ago before I went here, um, League of Legends actually said that they will close down public chat channels. Not only for that reason, but also because of the gold sellers and so on. But w when you are a, a normal guy, you know, you're happy, peaceful, you log in League of Legends and you read the chat, it's suddenly like, oh no, I'm not going to play this game. The chat actually costs them users. It's a very hard problem they have. They have a system that players are actually, you know, can behave themselves, but that's kind of just working half. Oh, this is another thing I forgot. Um, it's a very interesting inside info. 60% um, of all sessions initiated in League of Legends are PvE. Um, you know, PvP is player versus player, PvE is player versus environment. So you can theoretically hook up with a team and play against AI. You can do that. More than half of the sessions are actually initiated by League of Legends with that. It shows that a single player variant of that game is missing because many people want to play that. The other reason is that many players want to train first because they actually are thrown to this arena of you know, hardcore players beating the crap out of you and calling you all sorts of swear words. Um, so this is uh, pretty interesting information. They sell skins. Um, skins means that you can change the look of your hero. So if you become attached with your favorite hero, you can actually buy a skin and it looks different. Because there's nothing frustrating more than, you know, you enter a team and you look cool, but the opponent has exactly the same champion and looks identical to you. You know, you want to be different. So you might actually, for your favorite champions, buy skins. The kind of frustrating thing here is that they don't have any preview in the game itself. So when you buy a skin, you have no idea how your hero looks afterwards. So you actually have to Google that up or look at a YouTube video. Um, why ever they do that, I have no idea. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not the best to sell a black box, like, oh, you look cool if you buy this bla black box. So you buy the black box, open it, and suddenly you say, oh my god, all pink? No thanks. <coughs> yeah. So skins are not their major revenue source because they're permanent. You only buy it once. You only buy it for your, ma for your favorite champions. So uh, this is not where all the money goes. Now, runes are very hard to uh, explain. <coughs> Basically, you have a page with all sorts of skills, and you can put runes in there to actually activate these skills. You know, you see some sample runes here. Because champions have a specific role, you want to optimize the skill runes to this champion's role. Meaning that if you have only one page with one set of skills, it's only for one rule. You need multiple pages to optimize all your champions you have in order to do that. And you can actually buy these runes and progress faster. This is the only thing in the whole game which you might call pay to win. Because if you buy all the runes and basically, you know, have like five, six rune pages and put the runes in there, you have an advantage over other players who basically play for free and have to grind through that process. Um, I think this is one of their major revenue sources because when you start the game, the only thing worth buying really is this. This is basically the, the key to, you know, progress your power faster. Um, the last sentence basically means that there are certain boosts in the game itself. You can, you know, increase the IP you earn and the experience you earn in the game. So if you buy that boost for real dollars, it actually increases your IP income. And remember, even runes are sold for RP and IP, both of the currencies. It is much wiser to boost your IP income and buy with that. So most players always play with boosts. The summoner itself, this is basically you as a player role, um, is the whole progress thing. So you level up, you unlock certain things, um, and you gain XP and IP. Um, you have access to upgrades to certain skills, kind of called skill tree you have in, in the game itself, and you unlock that. Um, you can boost that, which is fine. Most people do that, but it's not really expensive. Um, but if you play a lot, you know, basically the whole thing fills itself anyway. Um, it's like not really a major thing. On the other hand, because you unlock a lot of things like powerful spells, your masteries, etc. Uh, this is one, one of the, their major retention things. So if you play the game and you're like two matches before, before you unlock your next spell or your next power, you just play these two matches, you know, just keep playing until you have that spell and just, you know, want to try it. Uh, it's a very major retention thing for them. Um, the game itself, most people don't call it pay to win uh, because you cannot really buy powerful stuff. Remember my first thing I said? Well, besides the one hero they release every couple of months, it's the only power thing. Um, but most players say it's not pay to win. 
uh, which is, you know, which is a good sign uh, because most purchases are just cosmetic or only boost to reach the highest level. Most pro gamers and most gamers who are really engaged into the game have maxed out their, uh, their rune pages and champions anyway. Um, we, uh, we have a local championship within Ubisoft um, and the pro team who always wins, most of them have all champions and have all the rune pages and they never spend any dollar. Um, you know, you can do that in League of Legends and still continue playing. Um, there's a constant challenge of PvP, because every PvP match is different, it's a very challenging game. Um, of course you want to have as many champions as possible, if possible all of them, because you want to counter certain strategies. And if you look at the, the tournaments of League of Legends and the players there, you know, they have all champions anyway. Yeah. Um, enjoyable team play, minus chat, of course, especially if you suck. Um, and the complexity actually is in favor of retention. What I mean with that is that the, the young players love the complexity, they love to talk about tech, tactics, strategies, they would watch all the YouTube videos where tactics are explained. They love to see the, the tournaments because this is where the masters play and they can actually see what tactics they empower against certain champions and learn a lot about that. And you see here some, you know, how big these, you know, they feel arenas, a whole football stadium full of, full of people, you know, watching their, uh, their major heroes playing their, their uh, favorite game. In terms of social, of course, you know, the multiplayer is very important. Team versus team is a very strong driver for multiplayer. They have a friends referral system in there, so you can earn a, l uh, a little bit IP and in-game rewards when you, you know, refer a friend. And he, if he levels up, you get rewards. Um, the lobby chat room before the match, you know, there are five people thrown into a team, another five people there, and there's a chat room in front where Beggy exchange tactics. Hey, you take this hero or this role, then I take this role, and you know, oh, we need one more supporter who wants to use it, so they pick certain champions in, uh, for their team. The matchmaker itself is, of course, very important. It has changed a lot in League of Legends over time. Uh, the matchmaker is key to success for a really good multiplayer game. Um, and you can read up how that exactly works in the wiki. Um, it's too complex to actually explain, but it's a player rank based system. Um, they of course have forums. Uh, I think the moderators have, have a hard work, you know, deleting all the swear words and banning players, because even in the forums, the language is not very nice. Um, the interesting thing is that League of Legends experimented with a tribunal system very early on. So you can actually report other players for bad behavior and there are other players judging if that player, you know, should be banned from chat or not. Um, interesting, I don't know how successful that is, but it can't be that successful because if you look into any match in League of Legends, you know, read the chat and you will see what I mean. So. Now you know what they sell, you know roughly what the game is all about, and you have all these KPIs we listed. So let's revisit them a little bit. So 70 million registrations since October 2009, 32 million monthly active users in 2013. Remember, I used 2013 numbers to sync them with, uh, uh, with the financial reports. 12 million daily active users, 3 million peak concurrent users, the $1.32 ARPU, and 624 million revenue in 2013. So with these numbers, you can basically calculate most of the trouble League of Legends has. And I say trouble, and you will see why. So 32 million active users times $1.32, so they roughly do 40 million a month. And you know, 40 million a month times 12, you roughly go to the 624 million, and if the user growth curve goes over the year, actually this is the number you come from. If we assume a $35 RPPU, which is kind of an industry standard for client-based games, we can actually see how many payers they have. So the 42 million divided by 35 means they have 1.2 million payers per month, which is less than 3.75% of their monthly active users. So they have a conversion rate of less than 4%. Uh, Is that any good? Usually client-based games rank between 15 and 25%. Most clients I have who have client-based free-to-play games on PC are anywhere between this number. Uh, World of Tanks has 30%. They have less than 5%. I have inside sources in Riot, uh, which actually gave me their true numbers, and they confirm they have less than 5% paying users. And that's very bad. For client-based game, actually, it sucks, if I may use that word. May I use this word? Can I swear on <laughs> Yeah, go for it. Okay. And with the less than 5%, actually it leads to 30, uh, $32 RPPU, which is close to the industry standard, which is nice. So if you pay, actually you're on average paying what the industry standard uh, expects from you, or a $1.63 ARPU. Um, but League of Legends has a conversion rate problem. 
And what that means for them is that for every 100 users they acquire, they only get five pairs. On mobile, it's a different issue, okay? You have a different problem. But on PC client, this is a huge problem. <coughs> so 5% conversion is really not good enough for a client-based game. Most people who start client-based games and operate them for a couple of months to optimize them, and they cannot get beyond 10% conversion on PC, they shut down the game. But League of Legends didn't. So you can ask yourself why. One reason, of course, is that League of Legends gives away too much for free. The championship rotation, access to all the champions, you know, all the IP you get. You can buy everything in the shop with IP, with this soft currency you can grind. You know, they might actually start selling exclusive premium champions, but you know, most people will cry out and say, oh my god, pay to win is coming back. Or they just sell tournament systems like Dota 2 does, but they don't. Um, wh whatever they do, the, the CEO of Riot said, you know, um, you know Optimizing our monetization system currently is not on our priority list. So somehow they earn enough money. And 624 million is not too bad, right? But the reason why League of Legends works only is because they huge reach. Because they have over 60 million players, this is the reason why they monetize so well. They scale of the users. But the question is, could you do that? They could. And Tencent invested a lot of money into them to actually scale up their user base. So it means that if you don't expect or have this user base, you should not look into League of Legends and copy or, let's say, use best practices of the monetization system. You should not. Many clients approach me and say, oh, we have here a team arena-based game, and you know we're doing it like League of Legends. And the first thing I have to tell them is, no, don't. You will fail. Because League of Legends monetization system is only working for them. It's a special case because they have the huge reach. And I bet most of your games won't have the reach they have. But of course what you should do is, you know, you should learn the weaknesses, why it works and how it works to see how you could basically adapt the system um, to be better. And if you look at Dota 2, they have an entirely different monetization system. Actually that might work better or not. We'll see. You know, we might actually look into this. Um, so. This is basically what the surprise end is, is that although League of Legends is the most successful or the biggest online game we have, the monetization system is not the best on this planet. Actually, if you adapt the monetization system, you will fail. This is how, in quote, bad it is for proper free-to-play monetization. So if you have any questions, you know, I'm opening up. Thank you. Um, amazing talk, Toy. Thank you. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to. I know I'm supposed to ask an insightful question, but what I really want to know is, who do you think is going to win the Evil Game Design Challenge tomorrow? I, <laughs> Steve, he's such a nice guy. He can't aggressively do this. No. Uh, really? Yeah, that's 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 possible. Uh, I have I have no idea. It's it's you actually pick very good candidates that I have no idea, but oh. I I'm watching it. Oh, you're a past winner. You got to come heckle. I give the trophy to them, no? All right, guys, you have the unique opportunity to pick one of the smartest guys in the industry's brain up here. I suggest you uh, make use of that. Who has questions? Um, let's go from left to right. Yes, sir. The question was, do I know the China revenue profile? Um, I know that nearly half of their users are coming from Asia, which includes China. Um, so their huge growth in users from 32 million to 67 million is actually th due to 10 cents reach. Um, the financial profile compared to the Western profile, I just can guess. I know comparisons that you know that they they pay far less depending on earning and so on, but I I don't have exact numbers. Sorry for that. Uh, the reason why is that Asia is very difficult to enter. So uh, it's not my primary focus because it's for free to play, it's like an alien planet. They're like five years ahead of the rest of the world. Um, to actually claim that I know how to enter China with a free to play game would be, I think I would lie. Um, <laughs> it's, I, n nearly no Western game has entered China yet successfully, minus the ones with very close corporations like Tencent, World of Warcraft, etc. Um, I think for us Europeans and Americans is one of the toughest markets to actually enter, specifically because they are so far ahead. Their market development and free-to-play, you know, at least five years ahead. I, li I, I look into China for input, 
you know, what the hell are they doing now? And you say, oh, well, that might actually work in a couple of years here. It's like a look into the future. That's a fascinating thing on that market. Yeah. There was another one here. I was actually wondering um, if you have any numbers or statistics about how far a player goes, because they progress for levels like one through 30, and 30 is the max level. Like, what do you have any numbers about when exactly a player would be converted on average? Um, it's a tough question. I can only say by experiments and asking people who played and quit the game. Um, most people quit really early, like within a week. Like 90% of whatever players try the game quit within the first week because they're so frustrated. Whoever is left there stays to the end until they have like 100 champions and you know max level anyway. Um, so they, I guess they have a really high churn rate like this and then have a really flat base there. Uh, no one quits the game when they have like 40 champions already. They don't. It's how, how far did you get? Me? Yes. That's a very unfair question. May I skip this? Um, I, I was really frustrated with the game and I tried really hard. Um, <laughs> and you know, after a month, I simply quit. Uh, I couldn't. So I, I changed my tactic to actually interview pro players to see how they play and you know, how their experience were, which was much better feedback by, because I couldn't enter the mid game in this game. I finished basically end of early game which is like the first free-to-play game which ever did this to me. Yeah. But you know, it's, I'm twice as old as the average player. Mm. I don't know. It's not for grandpas. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the nerfing of the, and how annoying that was for players, but I've heard the maxim that if you're not annoying a lot of your users, you're not monetizing properly. <laughs> what do you think of this theory? No. Um, <laughs> when, you know, you're monetizing well if you have cool, st cool stuff to sell. So if someone spends $10 on an item and he gets something back worthwhile, he will probably spend another $10. If he buys, you know, let's say you have a 15-year-old, right, and he just spent like $10 out of his own pocket for a champion, and after four weeks, the champion is only worth half of it and is half power. You know, this kid will never spend $10 again. Um, the same with other people. As I said, payers are not stupid. They want the, the worth of their money back in functionality, in meaningful items, or you know, even in power. And if they don't get that, or if it's reduced in power, they will stop spending. And I bet that many spenders in League of Legends, you know, m most of the pro players I actually interviewed says that if you spend 50 bucks on League of Legends, you have all you need, you can stop. So I think that they have a lot of first payers, and the second payment is really low. But in most successful free-to-play games, the second payment you know, is like nearly 100%. So most pairs actually have a second payment. And then a third and a fourth. So you spend like four year or two or three, and not just like once and never again. Um, it's a c sort of frustrating in this game. Yeah. There was another question here in the corner. Yes? How do they keep the user base? Could you repeat the question for the audience, please? Yeah, um, the question was that when they have such a high churn rate in the first week and many players leave, how do they actually keep their user base? Um, I think the number one growth factor for them is actually word of mouth. So, you know, if someone goes into the game, uh, 20 year old, and masters the game and say, hey, this is so cool, he want to have all his friends in the game as well. I think this is the number one reason uh, why the user base grows so fast, besides having Tencent plug in their network into the game. Um, and of course, then if you're into gaming anyway, you know you cannot ignore the success of the esports. So at some point, you will try the game. And um, in 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 all the clients' companies where all the gamers are, you know, I simply say, who has played League of Legends? All hands go up. So all of them have played it. Um, I think this is one of the secrets. Is basically the word of mouth. Without that, actually, they would have a, a marketing problem. Yeah. Thanks for the discussion, first of all. I thought it was really interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of um, the experiments or hypothesis tests um, that a game like this um, might be running, and um, maybe some of, the, some of the interesting results or insights that they would gain from, from running a test? You mean if they do A-B tests and stuff? Or what Something do you mean? like that, yeah. Uh, Testing in, in production to see you know, what's working better. I, I don't work for Riot. Uh, I know that their companies run uh, a lot different than most game developers are. Um, they also have a different uh, 
hiring process, different company structure. Uh, so I guess they have a different test structure. But from, from the results I see, because most champions are overpowered their release, I think their internal testing isn't good enough. Um, but to be honest, uh, I have no idea what, what to answer that question. I don't think they run A-B tests. And the reason is that in a PvP game to run A-B tests is suicidal. Uh, this is the first thing, so they need a test server, which they have, where they experiment with stuff. And all the menu stuff which they have in, in, in outside of the game, uh, I think they are not even capable of running A-B tests. Because here's a kind of little secret, the client itself, where you play the game, is basically the client in a window. It's like, you know, I guess written C++. But every time where you manage champions to shop and configure your pages and runes, it's actually programmed in Adobe Flash. And this is a very strange system they have because it takes ages to launch the client and go back and forth. Um, it's like ancient technology they have. Um, I think this is also hindering them doing proper A-B tests. But to be honest, I don't think they need A-B tests because they know once we have a customer and he loves the game, he will never leave. Um, but basically, bottom line is um, very tough question to research if you're not working at that company. What about um, things like, like classification or understanding um, before uh, someone emerges as a, um, a long-term player or, or you, a whale? You have to realize that League of Legends is very old, from 2009. That was, you know, that was when Zynga started their stuff. Um, meaning that all these questions you currently ask weren't even known to exist back then. Um, so the question is that over the time of growth, do they feel the need to answer these questions? And I don't think so. Um, I think that, that as they don't optimize the monetization system at all, I don't think they look into their metrics a lot. Th this is my, uh, but this is pure guess, okay? And if you talk to the right people, um, they do all sorts of different things. But I don't know how big their metrics department is, to be honest. Do you think it might be, sorry. Uh, like one, okay. one more question, and then everybody gets to pull Toit apart yeah. like a wishbone so if there's anything after the talk. I, I know, you, you actually approach me later on because thank there you. might be different questions, yeah, but thank you. Yeah. Just one more question. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned Wait for the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned apart from skins being in the $10 proposition of value, uh, what were the other criteria that you had in your mind about what were the value propositions for uh, purchases? Was it strictly subjective? Was it um, something that you personal or was it just more of a data driven? I mean, the, I just said $10 because, you know, they're very in price <coughs> and also in valuability and rarity. But uh, whatever is permanent and visible to other players is worth a lot of money. Um, and and if there's a $2 skin, you actually just buy it like this. Uh, if there's a $5 skin, you might just buy one. But if you have 100 champions, and if you love 20 of them, you might want like 20 skins. And that might be too expensive if you just charge $10. But if you ask me what is a really good price for permanence, which is like that, uh, any price is good if it reflects the power and the sexiness of this item. In my games, the most expensive items are roughly $100, one item. So, which is, you know, and they're selling really well. But we, of course, have items which are cent-based and some permanents which are just a dollar. But yes, there are some items which are really powerful and they're a hundred dollars. Basically, the rule is that when someone enters a shop, there should be a powerful item for him for any pocket size. So, if there's someone who just has like a dollar to spend, who should, he should find a really good item to buy. And if there's someone who wants to spend one hundred dollars, even for him, there should be a sexy item to buy. This should be the rule. League of Legends fails in this completely. They just have like flat pricing. Yeah. Let's give it up for Toit Vitamin, ladies and gentlemen.